Again, thank you all for joining and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, also, thank you to everyone who's filled out the email survey I sent out um, just to get some feedback about our current format. Um, we're looking to finalize next year's program and um, just want to make sure that we're addressing everything to reach everyone and make this uh, productive. So uh, if you haven't filled that out, um, maybe it's like five, six questions should take about a minute um, and would definitely appreciate it. Um, and so for today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gopal Lalshandani. Um, Dr. Lalshandani is one of our fourth year residents. Um, he is originally from Sacramento and then uh, came to the Bay Area uh, to UC Berkeley for undergrad. Uh, he studied history and excelled at Berkeley, uh, graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a near perfect GPA. Um, and he actually started his UCSF career while he was at Berkeley. I did research uh, with the anesthesia group here um, and uh, published a paper with them and then uh, went on to Wash U for medical school afterwards. Um, he did uh, some hand research at Wash U and then came out and rotated with us um, when he was a fourth year. Uh, he was actually my sub I uh, when I was the chief on the arthroplasty service, so had um, a couple weeks of working with him where uh, you could tell um, he was a hard worker, did a great job, and uh, we were fortunate to have him match here with us. Um, and he's uh, really done well as a resident too. Um, he's uh, done quite a bit of hand research, uh, presented all over the place, uh, had grant funding from uh, societies as well as internal funding. Um, and then um, he's speaking to us today about the growth of the orthopedic fellowship, which is uh, quite appropriate as shortly after he finishes, he'll find out where uh, he's matching for his hand fellowship. Uh, so uh, he'll have his talk and then uh, find out his next step. So uh, Gopal, thanks for presenting today and uh, look forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you for that kind of introduction. So today I'll be discussing the growth of the orthopedic fellowship. Some of you may be wondering why I picked this topic and how it is relevant to you. So before I try to answer these questions, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. So if you pick up your phone and go to menti.com and enter the code 312432, I'd like your input on what you think is the most important reason for the growth of the orthopedic fellowship. And in fact, while you're getting there, I think there's actually two parts to this question as not only are there more orthopedic surgeons who are doing fellowships, but there are also more spots being offered. So I'd appreciate your thoughts with a word or two on either of those trends. We, we need you to repeat that number, please. Sure, it's, it's on the screen, but it's 312432. We're getting some interesting responses here. We have a, a 20, 26 and counting. I'll wait for a couple more minutes uh, uh, since we have 81 people on the line. Any last minute, any last minute additions? There we go. So I'll pause things right there. So clearly this topic has both uh, educational and financial ramifications on both a local and a national scale. And so I anticipate that some of the issues that I bring up will be relevant across all divisions in our department and also be important from both a financial and educational perspective. As a quick note, we'll be using Mentee later in this talk, so please keep it open. So while this is a really broad topic, my goal for this talk is to first look at the growth of the orthopedic fellowship through the lens of the rise of subspecialization. I'll then get into the growth of orthopedic fellowship spots, and then I'll continue my discussion by looking at some of the costs of this trend. And so before I do so, I have a few disclaimers and disclosures. So while I intend to discuss the growth of the orthopedic fellowship through a strictly evidence-based approach, I must provide the disclaimer that the existing data in our orthopedic literature is quite limited. So sample sizes are unavoidably small given the small nature of our specialty and then the subspecialties that are studied. Additionally, data is often questionnaire based. Nonetheless, uh, some of the results I present will hopefully be thought provoking and encourage continued discussion about the future of education in our, in our department. And finally, while I don't have any financial disclosures, I do have the bias that I'm a resident. And so along with the rest of my class will likely become fellows. And so this will inevitably impact my viewpoint. 
However, my goal for this talk is to discuss some hard data and allow you to draw your own conclusions. So to start things off, I'll talk about the growth of the orthopedic fellowship by talking about the rise of subspecialization within our field. So one of the most cited papers on the topic of orthopedic subspecialization is this study published in JBJS with Dr. Vail as a senior author. They use data from the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery Part 2 database to help look at trends in subspecialization amongst graduating uh, orthopedic surgery residents. And by using this ABOS Part 2 examination data, this group helped determine the ratio of fellowship trained to non-fellowship trained graduates from 2003 to 2013. As you can see, they found the percentage of fellowship trained applicants uh, increased from 76% in 2003 to 90% in 2013. Similarly, the non-fellowship trained group had a similar downward trend. They thus concluded that orthopedic surgery graduates have become increasingly subspecialized over the past decade. So I thus sought to see if this national trend paralleled the experience of some of our former residents here at UCSF. Thanks to Nicola, I was able to obtain some names of former UCSF orthopedic surgery resident graduates over the past three decades. And when looking at how many of these graduates pursued a fellowship post-residency, a minority of the graduating class in 1990 and 1991 pursued a fellowship. Pictured on the right here is Dr. Gus Gialamis, who went straight into practice after completing residency in the early 90s. And you may actually recognize this uh, familiar face to the left. That's Dr. Coughlin with him and on an international trip to doc with Dr. Gialamis to Guatemala about 30 years ago. And as we proceed through the 90s, in 1996, exactly half of Dr. Kolobos's class went into fellowship. You can see him pictured here, second from the left. 1999 marked the first class of graduates who uniformly completed a fellowship post-graduation. This class featured a younger Dr. Tay, you can see here with hair, uh, who's going surfing with some co-residents. And in the early 2000s, when Dr. Morshed was a junior resident, um, there were at least a few residents every other year who did not go into fellowship. But one thing has remained the same since then, and that's that residents still go on bike rides with Dr. Diab almost 20 years later. In the late 2000s, graduating classes had near 100% rates of going into fellowship, with former graduates like Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Dang, and also Dr. Hansen, going into fellowship after completing their residencies. And this trend has persisted over the last five years, with a 100% rate of UCSF residents going into fellowship after graduation between 2014 and 2019. But some of you may be wondering what is new about this topic, since our department has been at near 100% fellowship rates over the past five or 10 years. And so a newer trend in the orthopedic fellowship has been the more recent rise of the second fellowship. So I thus sought to look at the rate of our own graduates pursuing a second fellowship over the past decade. So when looking in the late 2000s, our graduates almost never pursued a second fellowship. When Dr. Morsha in 2008 pursued a dual, pursuing dual training was relatively uncommon. This picture shows him with a full head of hair, taking some time to enjoy with some co-residents. As a side note, you can also see a younger Dr. Kandemir, who uh, uh, who is of course still on call while everyone else is, is enjoying. However, as we proceed through the past decade, this class you may recognize featured two surgeons who went on to pursue dual training. And while there are of course fluctuations every year based on personal interest and life circumstances, our highly achieving graduates of 2018 had three out of seven in their class who have already pursued a second fellowship, thus indicating a likely new trend. So the growth of the orthopedic fellowship is not just a national phenomenon. It's been a longstanding part of our training here at UCSF, and it continues to grow with second fellowships. So clearly there's been an increase in orthopedics graduates who have been pursuing subspecialty fellowships over time, but the reasons for this are not clear. One possible explanation is the changing landscape of orthopedic surgery with, uh, um, uh, with an increase in work hours restrictions and uh, increased supervisions. However, a group of researchers in Canada sought to investigate this question. Canada has seen similar trends in the growth of the orthopedic fellowship, and uh, they wanted to try to understand why this is happening. So they provided a questionnaire to all Canadian graduating orthopedic surgery residents in hopes of understanding why they are pursuing additional training. The common reason cited was a growing expectation by providers and employers to be fellowship trained surgeons and a failure of Canadian residency training to adapt to this. So 
So when asked if graduating residents felt prepared as a general orthopedic surgeon, an overwhelming number of the 50 Canadian graduates surveyed felt trained for practice as a general orthopedic surgeon. However, uh, similarly, very few of them felt that the trend of increased fellowship was due to inadequate residency training. However, almost half of respondents did acknowledge that they may decide against pursuing a fellowship if residency was lengthened or if they were guaranteed a position as a generalist. But the lack of a guaranteed job as a generalist is yet another driver towards subspecialization. In fact, the market is requiring more fellowship trained surgeons. In this study published in 2012, investigators looked at the number of job postings for orthopedic surgeons in JBJS, and they identified postings that required fellowship training during four specific years across a 25 year period. They found a statistically significant increase in the number of ads requiring fellowship training across all four years studied, and the difference between each year studied was significant as well. So thus, these researchers concluded that it's, it's reasonable to think that at least one driver of subspecialization is the American healthcare market, where patients hope to be seen by experts. So I therefore looked at our market here in San Francisco, and in particular our department, to see how much of a preference there is for fellowship training amongst our own surgeons. So in looking at our own attending orthopedic surgeons, the clear preference for fellowship training is evident. So while we do work at a tertiary referral center with increasingly complex cases, the wide majority of surgeons in our department have at least one year of post-fellowship, uh, post-residency fellowship training. In fact, there's actually only two actively operating attending surgeons in our department who did not do a fellowship after residency. And you may be wondering who these exceptional people are and what they did with their extra time. So Dr. Kim, as you may know, joined the UCSF faculty directly after residency and likely spent his time becoming a, uh, a, working to become a true surgeon scientist. And the other is actually Dr. Kolovas, who went straight into practice after residency and spent his time chasing similarly academic pursuits. So as I alluded to, one of the most, one important reasons for subspecialization is complexity. I think most of you listening were not, not at all surprised that a wide majority of our surgeons are fellowship trained, and that is because of the complexity of patients that we care for at UCSF. Additionally, orthopedic surgery knowledge continues to grow, so subspecialization is a way for providers to truly master their part of an ever-growing field. Moreover, in a procedural field like ours, new techniques and technologies are developed at an increasing pace. So subspecialization allows surgeons to keep up with these technical advances. And there are many examples in the orthopedic literature of studies that suggest better outcomes after certain procedures are performed by high volume subspecialists compared to lower volume generalists. So one example is this study published in the Journal of Arthroplasty last year. The, author, the authors conducted a retrospective review of almost 300 patients who underwent hemiarthroplasty for femoral neck fractures by arthroplasty trained, trauma trained, and general orthopedic surgeons. They found that general orthopedic surgeons had a significantly higher risk of surgical complications in this cohort when compared to the other surgeons. They also found a higher rate of one year, a higher one year mortality rate amongst the main surgeons. The researchers thus concluded that arthroplasty trained surgeons should care for these patients primarily. While there were of course a number of unique limitations to study from the codes that were used to the inability to control for baseline hemiarthroplasty volume, these types of studies reveal a changing paradigm on what is considered a general orthopedic surgery case. And again, when looking locally here at UCSF, we can see a steady decline in the number of hemiarthroplasties done by non-arthroplasty or non-trauma trained surgeons shown here in blue. Uh, over the past nine years. While these data are undoubtedly confounded by the advent of our excellent hip fracture protocol in 2018, there has been a concomitant rise in the number of hemis performed by arthroplasty surgeons over the past, uh, over the same time period shown in green. And while this data set is inevitably limited by low numbers, one interpretation of these data is that hemi arthroplasty for femoral neck fracture, a previously considered bread and butter, butter surgery for a generalist, may now be becoming the domain of a subspecialist even in our own institution. And when going back to the study by Patrick Horst et al. that I started our discussion with, this group found similar trends in subspecialization. By using CPT codes to determine which procedures subspecialists were performing, they tried to understand what percentage of procedures performed were within one surgeon's area of subspecialty training. They found that hand and spine surgeons were more likely to perform procedures in their own domain, whereas adult reconstruction surgeons may be more willing to venture into other fields of orthopedics. But more importantly, the graph to the right shows the percentage of procedures performed within one's own fellowship subspecialty 
and it reveals an increased rate of surgeons doing procedures exclusively in their subspecialty from 2002 to 2014. This can lead to a self-fulfilling cycle as surgeons feel more time working, uh, spend more time working in their areas of fellowship. They consequently feel increasingly uncomfortable working outside of their subspecialization and are thus like, less likely to do so. Additionally, the renowned Dr. Sarmiento, who was a vocal critic against subspecialization because he felt that general orthopedic surgeons would be more susceptible to questioning or litigation in the event of an adverse outcome when doing orthopedic procedures outside of their subspecialty. Moreover, literature like the article I just presented claiming better outcomes by subspecialists can exacerbate this trend. Thus, the cycle of subspecialization can be a self-fulfilling one. But this cycle of subspecialization is not unique to orthopedic surgery. In fact, the concept of specialization dates back to the Industrial Revolution, when philosopher economists like Adam Smith advocated for a division of labor to help increase productivity. In his 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, Smith advocated for specialization amongst manual laborers. In a mental experiment conducted in his book, he noted that if a pin maker who made 10 pins a day could partner with 10 other pin makers, by specializing in a specific part of pin production, they could then increase their productivity to 48,000 pins per day. Hyperspecialization is a more recent business term coined by a group from MIT who published their thoughts in the Harvard Business Review. They proposed that hyperspecialization was just a natural extension of this division of labor concept that was applied to our modern 21st century economy. Hyperspecialization occurs when work done by one knowledge worker is broken down into more specialized pieces and done by several knowledge workers. Thus, hyperspecialization may just be a reflection of our modern world in 2020. And this trend of subspecialization is common across our modern economy, but it's also common across medicine as well. This graph shows the growth of subspecialization and fellowships amongst internal medicine graduates, which has risen from 7% in the 1950s, astoundingly to above 80% in the early 2010s. It's important to note that financial pressures have undoubtedly prompted the flight from primary care and the push to subspecialize in internal medicine. Newly graduating internal medicine graduates are much less likely to become primary care providers given recent concerns over compensation in primary care. But this trend of subspecialization across medicine holds true particularly in procedural subspecialties like general surgery, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, plastics, and neurosurgeries, all of whom have seen increased uh, rates of fellowship over the past few years. This study was published in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education in 2014, and the authors attributed the rise of fellowship in these procedural specialties to be due to changes in surgical training with fewer hours and increased supervision. However, orthopedic surgery continues to lead the way, with 87% of graduates planning to pursue a fellowship in 2012. So I think this begs the question, why is the rate of fellowship so much higher in orthopedic surgery compared to other procedural subspecialties? And also, while the causes of this are undoubtedly multifactorial, the authors of this study cited the enormous growth of techniques and procedures across orthopedic subspecialties over the past decades as a potentially driving force. And when thinking back to Adam Smith, maybe it's the fact that orthopedics is both a knowledge worker type job and a technical worker type job that is pushing us to subspecialize even more than our counterparts. So while I hope I've convinced you that orthopedic fellowships have continued to grow over the past decades, another related phenomenon has been the increased growth of orthopedic fellowship spots. So some of you still may be wondering why I chose to tackle this topic, and one inspiration was some of the lively discussions we had during education committee meetings when multiple divisions proposed adding fellows to our department. In 2019 alone, we saw proposals to add spine, teeds, and sports fellows to our department. So I thus sought to look at our own department data over the past decade to see how many positions we filled. Back in 2012, our department had seven fellows. Looking forward to 2022, we'll have 13 spots available for fellows. And while there's inevitably some annual variability on how many spots are filled uh, compared to those that are offered, and this chart does include a non-operative sports position, I think the upward trajectory in our department is quite clear. But as I suspected, this trend is not just a local phenomenon at UCSF. The growth of orthopedic fellowship positions is both is in fact a national trend. So I'm looking at each subspecialty, there's been an increase in the number of fellowship spots available that has outpaced the number of spots filled over the past three decades. This trend holds true for sports, hand, 
adult reconstruction, spine, trauma, peds, foot and ankle, and shoulder and elbow fellowships. And while there's unfortunately a dearth of data points between 2001 and 2009, uh, this arrow represents the 2003 ACGME uh, work hours restrictions as to where it lies on each timeline. Nonetheless, I think the upward trend since the 2000s is quite clear. So clearly fellowship, the number of fellowship positions has increased across all subspecialties nationally, and it in fact increased significantly by 25 positions per year from 2010 to 2017, when data was more rigorously recorded. Um, it is clear that this national phenomenon, uh, that this is a national phenomenon, and in fact our department may actually be a bit, may have been a bit slower than others when it came to adding fellows. But while fellowship spots have clearly grown nationwide, one very reasonable explanation is the growth of residency, residency spots over the same time period. In fact, there was an increase of 100 spots in the decade between 2009 and 2018, accounting for a 16% increase. However, the growth of orthopedic fellowship spots has outpaced residency spots. In 2013, there were about 700 allopathic residency graduates and 100 osteopathic graduates, totaling 800 graduates. But their 900 fellowship positions offered in the match that year were far more numerous than residency positions. And this mismatch still holds true. And currently, there are more fellowship spots offered in orthopedic surgery uh, compared to the number of graduates. And this trend has been well studied, and a multi-institution group of researchers retrospectively looked at data in the orthopedic uh, surgery fellowship match in, in the SF match between 2013 and 2017. Their data reveals that there was a slight but steady growth in the number of positions offered across all subspecialties. And the studies that in the subspecialties they included were sports, adult reconstruction, spine, trauma, peds, foot and ankle, and shoulder. With the exception of adult reconstruction, the growth in each of these spots has consistently outpaced the number of domestic applicants in each subspecialty. However, this study also reinforces the annual variability in graduating residents uh, pursuing any given subspecialty. Fellowship spots can better accommodate for this if there are more positions than there are applicants. And this also allows extra fellowship positions for international graduates and surgeons who are hoping to pursue more than one fellowship. Regardless, it is clear that the growth of fellowship options has outpaced the number of applicants. The drivers for this phenomenon are also likely multifactorial and also poorly studied, but I'll try to provide some evidence-based information on certain drivers. So first of all, faculty and departments benefit from recruiting highly qualified residents to join as fellows. Their ability to conduct research and provide patient care invariably adds to the prestige of a department. Moreover, financial pressures and economics undoubtedly play a role as they probably should when deciding hospital staffing. So in order to discuss the finance of the situation, I'll discuss the evidence around hospital consolidation, the value of trainees, and the impact of accreditation to hopefully clarify some of these trends. So to start things off, when discussing financial pressures surrounding academic medical centers, one clear trend has been the consolidation of medical centers. Today's teaching hospitals operate in a world of increased expenses and reduced funding in the setting of Medicare cuts. Thus, academic centers are increasingly merging with non-academic hospitals to achieve economies of scale. This allows greater purchasing power and leverage with insurers. And this 2014 study reported that 20% of annual hospital mergers involve academic medical centers. And this is of course relevant to us with the growth of UCSF on a regional scale. In addition to the growth of the size of academic medical centers over the past two decades, residents have had increased restrictions on work hours as I previously alluded to. Well, I have presented some data that suggests that this does not directly lead to diminished quality of training as a driver of fellowship. It has undoubtedly led to changes in hospital staffing. So this study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009 estimated a $1.6 billion loss in annual labor costs if resident work hours were further restricted and transferred to substitute providers. In retrospect, the timing of the study was particularly noteworthy because it occurred after the 2003 ACGME work hours rules were implemented and after the Institute of Medicine further recommended to restrict work hours to 16 hour shifts in 2006. Thus, this study was published in direct response to potential further limits on resident hours after the landmark changes in 2003. While this unfortunately does not provide direct evidence about fellows, uh, and there's unfortunately no great literature addressing the economics of orthopedic fellows from a healthcare systems perspective, a clear conclusion of this article is that trainees are an economical way to care for patients. 
Additionally, hours restrictions have clear economic implications from a systems perspective. These authors acknowledge that one way to address the financial gap is by adding trainees, but they also recognize that this could have uh, additional negative consequences. Another important topic that helps illuminate some of the financial pressures surrounding the topic of, uh, uh, surrounding the, topic of uh, the orthopedic fellowship is the topic of ACGME accreditation. So this group of investigators out of Brown University retrospectively looked at the number of fellowship positions available in 2013, and they found a significantly higher rate of orthopedic fellowships that were ACGME accredited in sports and hand surgery, and a lower rate across all other subspecialties. So this was attributed to the fact that both sports and hand fellows can obtain a subspecialty certificate of added qualification from the ABOS if they graduate from an accredited program. So ACGME accreditation is necessary to help attract qualified applicants. However, accreditation places limits on duty hours, restricts privileges on operating independently, and prohibits billing for independent procedures. Thus, it does not make as much sense for these other fellowships to focus on accreditation when thinking about things from an economic perspective. Non-ACGME accredited fellows can provide valuable care if they're able to per perform procedures and independently bill for uh, procedures on call. This also uh, provides, uh, uh, this also frees up attending providers to work at higher volume times, which is also adding value indirectly. So thanks to Dr. Hansen and Matt Callahan, I was able to look at the financial value that our non-accredited arthroplasty fellows bring to our department. Over the last three years, our arthroplasty fellows have accounted for an average of 2,000 RBUs per year. While this is still short of the lower range of a junior attending, this is undoubtedly a helpful contribution from a department perspective to help offset costs and inefficiencies that come with surgical training. So now that we've discussed some of the financial pressures that may play a role in the growth of fellowship options, I'll now turn to the cost of the growth of the orthopedic fellowship. In particular, I'll focus on the cost of fellowship with an emphasis on resident training. So one of the great things about our department has been its focus on resident education. And instead of convincing you that this is the case, I found a former resident that some of you may recognize who eloquently spoke about the importance of education in a recent Grand Rounds. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I was attracted to UCSF was because of the focus on residency education. It was really a priority here, and it seemed to me to be one of the great places to train, um, where I had a lot of the resources, attention of the attendings and the faculty um, towards my education. Um, on a more personal note, um, having been in Tanzania, one of the first things that you realize is a disparity in healthcare, um, but not only that, you realize the disparity in education. Um, for them, they only have three years of residency no lectures whatsoever, and many of them don't even really operate until they finish. And so it made me, first of all, appreciative of um, the education that we have here. But I think it also, you know, it's a humbling experience because you realize we at one point were also quite primitive in our approach to education. And I think even despite the advances that we've had so far in the past several decades, we still have a long way to go and times continue to change. So I thought this was an appropriate topic for us nowadays. And if Dr. Ding hasn't convinced you, then if you just look at our own website, Dr. Kim's letter to future applicants reinforces our commitment to resident education. In fact, he writes, our department is focused first and foremost on training residents. Compared to many other training programs you are likely considering, ours trains relatively few fellows, and some of our subspecialty groups train no fellows at all. We believe this commitment to resident education allows us to create a learning environment where your educational needs come first. So given our focus on resident training as a department and given our anticipated growth in, in fellowships, I sought to see if there's any existing evidence on how fellowships impact surgical training to help us as a department. Unfortunately, there are no large studies in orthopedic surgery to help address this issue. However, this study out of Australia and New Zealand sought to answer this very same question. So these investigators looked at almost a thousand trainees across both countries and looked at case logs and questionnaires from residents who did work with fellows and those who did not. While only about 15% of the trainees included were in orthopedic surgery, they reported some interesting results. So they first asked residents who worked with fellows and those who did not work with fellows how often they were second assistants. And as you may suspect, the rates of being a second assistant were significantly higher amongst residents who worked with fellows, characterized by a red bar, compared to those who did not. So for Dr. Churches and our interns, 
don't worry too much about being double or even triple scrubbed since that's how, tra how training goes in the land down under as well. But when looking at the objective numbers in the case logs of residents who did not work with fellows, they had a significantly higher case volumes when compared to the cohort that did work with fellows. These investigators separated cases, case logs into major cases here on the left and minor cases here on the right. Thus, these investigators concluded that residents who did not work with fellows were more likely to have higher case volumes and were less likely to be second assistants compared to those who did work with fellows. So the authors cautioned that this can cause a negative feedback cycle as the residents who work with fellows felt increasingly underprepared with basic procedures and they thought maybe this was leading to the growth of fellowship in their countries. And again, while there's no large scale studies evaluating the impact of fellowship training in orthopedic surgery, the urology department of the University of Toronto conducted a study surveying their members on the impact of fellowship on resident training. They reported some interesting results. So they submitted a five tiered questionnaire to their members the, of their department to see if they strongly agreed or strongly disagreed with certain questions. So as expected, when asked if fellows steal cases from residents in the OR, fellows felt this happened at a significantly lower rate than what residents perceived. Interestingly enough, faculty on average that were in agreement with the residents and thought that this did occur. So the next question asked of the department in this study was whether or not the division could support additional fellows. And before, you, I sh before I show you their resu results, I'd like to hear from those of you who are still listening. So if you go back to your phone and return to menti.com and enter the code 312432, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on, uh, on what's driving the, uh, um, on, on whether or not you agree if your division or the department can support additional fellows. So note that if you're faculty, please select your answer using the top slider and skip the rest. And if you're a resident, please skip the first two options and select your preferred response. Finally, the default level is level one, so please slide to the right to get to your selected answer. So I have the results, results hidden, so I'll wait till we get, get a fair number and then I'll, I'll show our results. We're at 36, oh perfect, still going up. So I'll give us a couple more seconds to give us give, give our thoughts. All right, seems like we've plateaued. Oh, one more. All right, perfect. So out of 40 responses, so this is, uh, me. This parallels the results of the investigators of the university. And so uh, the researchers in this, in this study found that faculty in this study uh, thought that their division could support more fellows and a, at a significantly higher rate than residents did uh, and fellows did. So again, comparing these results to the results in our, in our study, um, it looks like uh, uh, that's the same effect. And then when asked the converse question, the opposite, that opposite question had the same effect. So when asked if there were too many fellows, both fellows and residents were in agreement and thought that this was the case, while faculty disagreed with that statement. But not all the results are what you may expect. So when asked if fellows should participate in rounds, both faculty and fellows significantly felt that they should at a higher rate than the residents. So finally, in 2009, investigators uh, in orthopedic surgery tried to address the lack of data on this topic and look at the growth, the impact of the growth of fellowship on res from a resident perspective. These investigators acknowledged that some of the studies I've already discussed uh, in procedural specialties was an inspiration for their study, and they sought to provide some insight into our field. So in order to do so, they provided a questionnaire to PGY4 residents and various faculty members. 
In particular, these questionnaires were given to chairpersons, program directors, and fellowship directors to help represent a balanced faculty perspective. So when asked if fellowship training was an important educational issue for if it was an important educational issue for residents, both residents and faculty were in overwhelming agreement that this was an important issue. In fact, a higher percentage of faculty felt strongly that this was an important issue compared to residents, with 44.4% of faculty strongly agreeing with this statement compared to 32.5% of residents. And as one may expect, both residents and faculty agreed that a top area of conflict between residents and fellows would be operative cases, with 58% of faculty ranking this as an important area compared to 52% of residents. While workload issues were a far lower second area of conflict, the authors more importantly noted through some of their questionnaires that residents often felt a double crush phenomenon, particularly if operative cases were relegated to fellows and floor responsibilities were relegated to residents. The authors then concluded that this could have a negative impact on resident training. However, the authors also thought that the relationship between residents and fellows could be synergistic. In fact, a minority of residents and faculty felt that resident education was compromised by the presence of a fellow. And in fact, when a wide majority of residents and faculty agreed that fellows enhance uh, resident education. Of the 80% of residents who agreed with this statement, 58% thought that fellows were able to enhance their education in a way that faculty could not. Additionally, fellows were thought, as, were thought of as a common source of career advice, and this was thought to be an important part of resident education. Individual comments from residents highlighted that fellows would provide a more hands-on experience when they were supervising at procedures as junior attendings rather than as first assistants. And while resident training is clearly a potential cost of the expansion of fellowship training, there are many other important costs. I'll briefly address a few others in the hopes of completion. So first of all, the growth of the fellowship inherently means a longer period of training. Thus, this can lengthen periods of medical debt for many trainees. Additionally, in more rural areas, this can contribute to a worsening provider shortage if, if surgeons, are, surgeons are in training for longer, or if they're only able to participate, participate in subspecialty call. And finally, any discussion on the cost of fellowship would be incomplete if it did not include the financial cost to the trainee. This is the most well-studied aspect in the orthopedic literature. This data published in last year in JOS provided updated data on individual financial losses from pursuing a fellowship. So investigators performed a financial analysis comparing net financial gains or losses when comparing a subspecialist salary to that of a general orthopedic surgeon. They estimated that adding a year of fellowship would inevitably lead to financial losses in that first year when comparing the, fellow, the salary of a fellow to that of a general orthopedic surgeon. So they then tried to see when each subspecialist would break even or when they would start to see a return on their investment of pursuing a fellowship. So unsurprisingly, they found that spine subspecialization provided the highest return on financial investment with a break even point of five years. Adult reconstruction also had a positive return, but this was actually down to neutral when correcting for average hours per week. Sports and trauma were also found to have neutral returns. However, if one subspecializes in hand, pediatrics, or foot and ankle, these investigators felt that these subspecialists would never break even over the course of their career. However, I think these types of purely financial analyses are, are reductive and they minimize the multitude of factors that affects one's decisions to subspecialize. Regardless of these many factors, it is clear that session in orthopedics continues to increase. Additionally, the data that I've presented demonstrate that fellowship options will continue to increase and exceed uh, this need. And finally, I believe the studies I presented in the more recent part of my talk suggest that the growth of the orthopedic fellowship does have an important impact on resident education. And so while I've tried to keep this presentation focused on objective evidence on this topic, I'll take a couple of moments to reflect on what I have learned before opening up this space for discussion and questions. So first of all, from a resident and trainee perspective, I think there's two important learning points. So even though most of us will likely become subspecialists, it's important to be, continue to be engaged on all rotations, even if you may never do certain procedures in the future. I think the growth of the orthopedic fellowship makes us even clearer in that if we do not exhibit interest in a certain training area, there will invariably be other trainees or fellows who will gladly take over that role. Additionally, as we proceed through this process, we gain perspective, and it's important to maintain this perspective as we learn. 
So even though we know that Dr. Alabadi will soon take care of patients like this, an older, wiser version of himself may be on call one day and take care of patients like this. And if I may propose some learning points from the faculty perspective, I'd advocate that while fellows will inevitably continue to grow in our department, as they already have nationwide, it's important to continue to balance educational goals so our new interns and junior residents continue to learn. I hope that some of the pictures that I've shown today reinforce the proud tradition of training excellent surgeons in our department, and none of us ever want to train the next Dr. Death. On the flip side, the rise of the subspecialist is also clear. And if almost all residents are going into fellowship, it may be time to recognize this and adapt our teaching to train excellent subspecialists and not just adequate generalists. And finally, from a department perspective, I think it's important that we continuously critically appraise our service structures as we add trainees. While a layered hierarchical team structure may help involve trainees at all levels with all decisions, it can disproportionately put junior trainees at disadvantage if they're inundated with tasks of lower educational value. On the contrary, while a mentorship model of matching trainees to faculty can balance the playing field for junior trainees, senior trainees and fellows need to focus on higher level tasks, and they need administrative support to do so. And finally, and most importantly, our department has had an exceptional commitment to our mission of education, patient care, and innovation that we're all very proud of. As our health system continues to grow, we all have the responsibility to ensure that we continue to grow with an eye towards our mission and an emphasis on education. So going back to Dr. Sarmiento, who I mentioned was an outspoken critic of subspecialization, he once said, a calm and objective dialogue concerning these issues is long overdue. I hope that we can start an objective dialogue on this topic as we continue to grow in our department. So this brings me to the conclusion of my talk. And before turning things over, there are many people I should thank. I've had a lot of great input on this presentation from our tremendous faculty and my co-residents, and I've tried to acknowledge their many contributions with photos or even embarrassing videos of younger version of, versions of themselves along the way. But there's another group in our department who is often overlooked and I think often underappreciated who I need to acknowledge, and that is both our current and former fellows. So I'd like to thank all of them for helping me become a better learner and hopefully even a better educator over the past four years. So thank you, and I'll take happy to take any questions. Great. Um, it was a great talk, Gopal. Very interesting, and um, a lot of um, you know, I think interesting thoughts can come from it about how we best educate um, our trainees. Um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself, um, turn your video on, and ask away. Uh, Gopal, this is uh, Cindy Chang. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, my question. Uh, did any of the studies look at uh, gender breakdown in terms of um, the seeking of um, subspecialty? Yeah it's, great, yeah, it's a great question. Um, in fact, I didn't include it here, but there was actually one study that, that was focused particularly on that issue. And the conclusion was just that, uh, it was, the conclusion was that female um, uh, residents were more likely to pursue fellowship training. Um, so that was, that was the conclusion of that one study. Hi, Gopal. This is uh, Sanjeev Sabarwal. Uh, really an excellent talk. You touched on a lot of important points and, you know, we've <coughs> gone through some growing pains with pediatrics. And, you know, one thing that uh, sort of uh, came to light was uh, this thing about, you know, overseas graduates or for that matter, even Canadian graduates, you know, coming to this for training. I think there's somewhat, you know, licensing requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were to take a global view and the mismatch in terms of you know, surgeon versus you know, potential patients, do you think this is an opportunity to open a dialogue to see what are the ways to sort of increase the pool of applicants uh, from outside North America to come to the US for appropriate limited training and then return? What's, uh, what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think um, as I sort of as I alluded to, the, there is a mismatch between the number of domestic residency graduates and the number of fellowship options that we have. So I think we inherently uh, do allow for that, do allow for um, uh, foreign residency graduates to come train in in the U.S. And I think you know I think that's a I think that's a positive thing as I think it's important for us to sort of share some of our ideas. And I think you know oftentimes with uh, um, you know with interacting with with uh, other countries, we gain a lot even more, more than what we what we uh, um, than, than what we give. 
Um, however, I think there's there's a lot of political forces that play a role in that and limitations that can that can affect this. Um, and so I think that's that's you know more more of, you know can be affected more by a, a political and, and sort of uh, international visa based perspective than it can be by, just by the number of spots. Well, uh, great great talk. I really enjoy your you know presentation. So the question that you know I think. You guys at this point, you know, different residency program that what we had in the past. And the, um, my question is like, you know, I believe that the subspecialty training is needed. It's a need. It's not necessarily something that we added on for, you know, department benefit or our own benefit. Is there any possibility during the residency program that we can implement the subspecialty training and eliminate the, because eliminate the fellowship so it will kind of limit the extent of the education and training. I believe that we are, you know, by few residency training, additional fellowship training is adding too much time to your training. And a lot of times actually when you're subspecialized, you're not using some of the knowledge that you learn during the residency. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, there, this topic has a lot of um, sort of expert opinion and commentary on it. And some of the commentaries I read, uh, including from Dr. Sarmiento, advocated for that. So they, he thought that if we're, extending, uh, if we're sending people out to do fellowships elsewhere, then maybe we should be providing that subspecialization training in our own department as part of this. And this is more of a national discussion. So I don't think, you know, that this can be addressed on a single department level. Um, but I think that's one, one important point. I think conversely, the, the, other, the other aspect is also true. And that, as you already alluded to, there is value to, being, to, to learning as a generalist. And it may not be because you'll become a generalist, but it's rather to learn sort of concepts that, that, sort of, that, that tie everything together and to learn techniques and cross-pollinate across divisions. So I think there, there is role for that. But to, your, to finally, to get back to your point, I think that if we're becoming subspecialists at an increasing rate, it may be time to incorporate or allow for more time for that as part of our residency training to make sure we're prepared for that future as a subspecialist. Hi, Gopal. This is Mohammed Diab. Um, you know, I'm in I'm in a field that is in some ways a generalist field, and um, I always struggle with moving from one part of the body to the other and wondering if anybody else in the building is better than me at that given skill. So in pediatrics, increasingly we're doing, or people are doing second fellowships. Um, but we also have the you know, opposing forces of trying to get people to integrate, to not be in silos, to build bridges um, between different subspecialties and specialties. How do you reconcile those two? As we all run to become increasingly specialized and focused, are we going to lose, we may market ourselves better, but are we gonna lose in creativity, in sort of collaboration? Did you, how, how, did you, how do you feel after you, you, were, you did all your reading on this topic? Yeah, well, I think, um, so I mean, I, I don't know if there's a you know, clear data-based answer to that question. I think that you know, part of the strength of residency is that ability to, um, to sort of gain from different areas. And I think part of the, the, the benefit of being an academic center is, as you mentioned, that ability to access special, subspecialists in all domains. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think regardless of how people feel, the trend of increased subspecialization is clear. And so then the next question is, how do we mitigate that and how do we continue to learn from others? And I think, um, I, I, personally think that we have to look towards newer options. So if it's, you know, continuing to get together as a department and so that we can, you know, discuss certain cases and uh, uh, continue to cross pollinate, I think that's that, you know, the suggest the, the, the answer is to look forward and try to use technology to help gain from others uh, and continue to read in that, in that nature, uh, rather than to try to stop this, this wave of subspecialization. Because I think that's, you know, I think the, the evidence suggests that that's going to continue no matter, no matter how people feel. Hey, Gopal, I have a comment. Yeah. This is Sam Warshed. Um, I put a, uh, a book that I think anybody who's interested in this topic of specialization should take a look at. It's written by a guy named David Epstein, um, and it's called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Um, 
and the author uh, compares the success, the respective successes of Roger Federer and, and Tiger Woods in going through a huge amount of very diverse literature on the topic of, of who should subspecialize and when they look not just at sports, but just across education, technology, et cetera. It's a very interesting book. Um, I think it, it, it raises some important questions, not about subspecialization, because obviously both you know, a Roger Federer and a Tiger Woods are incredibly subspecialized, but it does identify when they subspecialized and when that subspecialization um, uh, benefited the type of activity that they're involved in. You know, tennis and, and golf are very different um, sports, just like arthroplasty and trauma are very different subspecialties. And um, I think that um, we ought to be thinking um, not for a single uh, solution to when we subspecialize, that it does depend a little bit on where we're trying to get. Um, and being mindful of that um, may um, give us a more enlightened understanding of, of when subspecialization ought to happen in the training of, of surgeons. Yeah, that's a great point. Gopal, this is Bobby yeah. Tang. Hey, wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering whether or not there is a, you know, the, the difficulty of being a generalist these days, and God bless Dr. Kim, is that you're almost having to be a subspecialist within as being a generalist, because you're kind of almost held to the same level of care and decision making as a subspecialist, but you're actually seeing many different types of problems. And um, it becomes, a, when, you do the, when you do your, your recertification, it starts to become a little bit of a, uh, uh, little bit of a challenge to be so good at everything. And uh, when you're in your silo, you tend to be able to focus. And as the recertification examinations are becoming more subspecialized and more focused, it seems like it's harder and harder to be a generalist. That's one, one comment. The other, and I would watch and see what you think about that. The other comment, the other question is, how do you, why do you, do you think that subspecialization is uh, also influenced by the fact that our medical legal environment is constantly pushing us uh, to the you know, level of uh, standard of care of subspecialists and that a generalist within a world of uh, increasing numbers of subspecialists is a little bit kind of a, uh, a target because you know if you're not doing something that a subspecialist would do, then it may necessarily be below the standard of care. And that drives people to focus more and become more siloed. Yeah, uh, so those are great points. Uh, so to address the first question on examinations, I mean, I think part of that, you know, I think we, we as a field are driving that. So number one, um, there's been a, just a, you know, tremendous growth in the amount of literature and, um, you know, research available. And I think that will inherently make examination, if you're going to sort of focus on the up-to-date uh, information or literature, then it's going to inherently make um, sort of taking these exams more challenging if you need to, if, if there's now, you know, if there previously was one orthopedics journal that everyone read, whereas now there's 20 and with one in each subspecialty. Um, so, you know, I think as exam makers, it depends on what we're trying to achieve. If we're trying to, um, you know, encourage the persistence of generalists, then, you know, making these exams more generic will be, will be, you know, helpful in focusing on larger concepts, whereas focusing on, you know, on specific studies in each subspecialty domain will make that more challenging. But I think the second question I think is even more interesting, and that's of the medical legal aspect. And Um, unfortunately, again, I, I, you know, they're, this is really studied, but, um, you know, when looking at some of the sort of, you know, expert opinions on the topic, um, I think the consensus is that, uh, at least from a, you know, expert opinion level, is that this can be a driver of both, um, you know, putting yourself at risk for litigation and then also uh, um, for causing more self-specialization, as I, as I alluded to. So I think that if there is evidence, you know, in certain studies, in, you know, in, 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 in a paper that says that you know hemis are better done by arthroplasty surgeons, and you have a complication as a as a generalist after doing a hemi, then you know you you, you definitely 
you know, you can be susceptible, depending on the quality of that evidence, to um, someone questioning you or at least litigation in that to that effect. And so that I think that those types of studies do, you know, do put you a little bit at risk, I guess, of that um, if the studies are well done. And I think that that's a different discussion. Yeah. yeah could I Thank you. jump jump in just briefly on the uh, on the certification uh, issue? So what you're describing uh, underlines the importance of board certification. So when you have board certification, you have uh, strong support and evidence that you can do the types of procedures effectively, uh, and you're not gonna be susceptible to a paper or a few papers that suggest uh, you know, somebody can do something better. Yeah. Uh, you, you've, you've reached a, a standard of care. The other interesting thing, if you look at the uh, the recertification, the question on the exams, you know the the exam has traditionally been focused on general orthopedic practice. And what drove a lot of the subspecialty exams that have come in now is not so much the uh, the the generalist fearing the subspecialists, it's the subspecialist not wanting to answer the general questions. Yeah, uh, because they've, as you've alluded to earlier in your talk, focused. Uh, another point: um, certificate of added qualification, hand and sports. These are driven largely by the subspecialties, mm -hmm. and uh, in wanting to maintain ACGME fellowship, and then you have to have an ACGME fellowship to get certificate of added qualification. On the hand side, it includes general surgery, plastics, and orthopedics. So it's a coordinated effort. Um, and it's complicated and it's controversial. It started out controversial, remains controversial. Not everybody believes that that's appropriate, uh, again, for the reasons you cited. On the spine side, you might ask yourself, well, isn't it unusual, given that spine is so specialized, that um, there isn't a subspecialty certification in spine? And uh, there are a couple reasons for that. One is on the neurosurgery side, their governing bodies have felt traditionally that they teach spine practice in residency. There's no need for fellowship. There's no need for added qualification. If you're a neurosurgeon, you're trained in spine. That's their, that's their point of view. So uh, even within the, the field of medicine, subspecialties of medicine, sections of medicine, there's differing opinions on these subjects of, of qualification. Great points, yeah. So it looks like uh, we have a comment from Rosie um, that another benefit of more subspecialization is uh, collaboration with colleagues across subspecialties. And I think that's um, definitely a great point. And, um, and then it looks, uh, I think Tony Ding may have a question or a comment, and then we'll probably wrap up after that. Yeah, I do. Um, Gopal, great talk. Thank you for distilling a very complex and broad topic into a very focused talk. So congratulations on that. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen um, in medicine in general, um, especially with internal, is of course the and the drive to become super subspecialized, um, and that's not going to change as as you um, so eloquently put it. But one of the issues face, especially internal medicine, is that there's so much subspecialization that you don't have a captain of the ship, and we've been struggling actually to build up general list of primary care doctors, the ones who actually drive their care. Um, one, do you think that we're in that same danger? Um, and two, as a result, do you, how, if any change made to how we structure the care that we deliver as orthopedists? For example, do we need a general orthopedist to sort of say, okay, I will see all the knee pain and then refer to the subspecialist? Yeah, those are, so those are great questions. Um, so regarding the concept of the captain of ship, I mean, I think inherently the primary care provider is the captain of the ship um, in sort of general medicine. Um, and that's, I think, a larger discussion as to, you know, that's you know increasingly being outsourced to, um, you know, um, allied health professionals. And, you know, that's, I think, a larger discussion. However, specific to orthopedics, I mean, you know, let's sort of think of the example of a general orthopedic surgeon. Um, you know, I, I think that if he's, I think there can be a slippery slope in that if you, that general orthopedic surgeon may not want to see all the non-operative issues for a hand surgeon and then refer appropriately. 
And so they'll either, um, you know, not not accept those patients, which you know is is bad from a patient perspective, um, or you know they they may sort of you know push themselves to sort of take you know take on that domain. Um, and so then the next sort of alternative would be to have a non-operative orthopedist or musculoskeletal uh, provider seeing all these patients. And I think that's also has is it can be a slippery slope because I think we you know we're trained as surgeons to be both the surgeon but also the person who's thinking and making the indication for surgery and you know doing the the knowledge worker type task. Um, and so I don't know if I can propose a great solution, um, but I think that if you're going to give sort of that whole general domain to one person. You know, you know, you know, ideally that person is a surgeon, but then from their perspective, they're not going to, you know, they may not be the best, they may not want to be the, the referring point for, for all these, you know, particular issues. But then finally, I think from a patient perspective, it can be frustrating. You see an orthopedic surgeon and you have knee pain and hand pain and they're a hand specialist and they're like, oh, I'll take care of your hand, but, you know, go see so-and-so for the knee and then go see so-and-so for the back. I mean, I think that can be a, a challenge from the patient perspective. So. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all again for uh, joining us. I think uh, another great talk. And um, up next is uh, Dr. Alex Gornitsky next week. So I uh, will see you all in a week. And go, Paul. Uh, good luck with the match today. Thank you.